of all, I'm very grateful to be here on Cafe with Business at the Hispanic Chamber. And I'm really excited to share with you a topic called Your Extraordinary Workplace. And it's really all about why and how to create a culture that allows people to be successful in this 21st century. So um, I've been in business since 2002, love what I do, and the mission of my company is to create a world where all people love their lives. So one of the questions that people ask is, you know, what are my thoughts about why it's important to have an extraordinary workplace culture and what, what is the uh, benefit of it? And so the reason that I think it's so important is that people are your greatest asset. And when you have a workplace culture that's excellent, it, it helps you to overcome a lot of challenges that are part of our world today. For example, we have such a speed of change now. Things that used to take years or months can take a day or a week. And so people are scrambling to understand things like uh, robotics or artificial intelligence or digital transformation or globalization. So there's a lot of complexity that people are dealing with and they need to have what's called agile behavior to go with that set of speedy uh, technologies that are coming in right now. The other thing is that we have a lot of diversity issues that are just up for all of us, maybe because we're so uh, global now in our communications, but there's uh, a lot of diversity where people are still at odds with each other over religion or politics or genderism or, you know, even the intergenerational is a big deal. And also uh, people are not necessarily staying fully engaged in their lives. A lot of them are shutting down. And in fact, the, the statistics show that 71% of people are shutting down either in a big way or a smaller way and that it costs organizations over a million dollars for every hundred people if they don't get that in order. And also people are struggling with how do I stay ahead of the competition? How do I stay relevant? For example, out of all of the Fortune 500 companies in 1955, only 26 of them have survived to today. So it's a big deal to be paying attention to what's coming next. And there's also the issues of how do we deal with you know all the negative behavior that is very evident and kind of in our faces right now? And what are the costs to us as human beings when we're not managing stress and we're not managing um, our wellness? So those are some of the reasons is those goals and those challenges that we're facing right now, we have to have excellent people in order to manage those. One of the challenges I have as a performance management specialist and a culture specialist is people really understanding what is wrong, what, you know, what's the problem? Why don't we have extraordinary workplaces? Why do we have so many symptoms of challenges? And part of it is, is difficult to explain that a lot of the systems we have been using for centuries it's time to dismantle those and people are uncomfortable with the thought of dismantling them because they are not sure what they would put in place instead and they become afraid of well what if what i've been doing is now outdated does that make me outdated does that make me irrelevant and we wouldn't say that if we were asking uh somebody if we still had a phone do they have, still have a phone from two years ago or five years ago we wouldn't feel ashamed that we upgraded we wouldn't feel ashamed that we upgraded our computer over the last 10 years or five years, but we feel ashamed if we think we should be updating our, our human systems. And the reality is they need to be updated just like the technologies around us. So if people could look at what are the cause and effects between the kinds of cultures we already have right now and what we should be moving toward. And so what we do is we kind of do what's called spitting in the soup of the control models because they're very popular and they look like they work really fast, but they actually have a lot of uh, negative effects and they don't develop people into fully engaged people. And just one quick example of one of four control models is dangling carrots and giving people incentives. Most people don't know that that's actually harmful to the commitment levels of people and that it actually pits people against each other and makes them very self-centered as opposed to creating the kind of engagement that you're hoping for. And so that's just one example of maybe unexamined ways that we do culture now. And then once there's a willingness to look and question the outdatedness of some of those models, then it's important to know what to put into the vacuum, what to replace them with so that you don't fall back on what you've always known. One of the really important things that I try to teach people is the importance of 
developing every single person on the team. And I think for many executives and managers, they still hold this mindset that we only have to invest in developing our senior team and our mid-level managers and our supervisors. And the reality is that's like saying, oh, we'll just give cell phones to the top people. And it's really not necessarily a good idea, but a lot of times people haven't wrapped their head around the fact that you can equip everyone. With today's technology and the ability of people to do things virtually, it's affordable and it's very convenient for people to all be developed at the same time. And the reason that's so important is because there's such a thing called agility. And agility means that a person can be confident to flex between being a leader or a follower. And what happens instead is most of us are sort of scripted into, oh, I'm not a follower, I'm not a, I, or I'm not a leader, I'm a follower, or I'm not a follower, I'm, I'm always the leader. And that causes us to be rigid in our roles. So for example, this is a, a personal example, but I used to have family meetings with my children. And when they were young, we would teach them from five years old on to take turns leading the family meeting. And one time we demonstrated that in front of a big audience of adults and the five-year-old ran the meeting. And it was very impressive because we underestimate the leadership skills of certain people and we do it in the workplace too. And what I said to the audience uh, was, you know, it was impressive that she could hold the process, she knew how to hold the authority, she knew how to delegate and keep track of the time and all of those things. But what you don't realize is I'm a dominant leader mother and it was hard for me to learn how to be a good follower when my five-year-old was learning how to lead. And so that taught me some lessons in slowing down, taking time to train, making sure I build my um, skills in encouraging the leader. And so when people have developed both sides of that for themselves, which we don't typically see consciously happening, it creates this ability for people to uh, create things on the fly, work in strong collaboration with each other, and a lot of things that are needed for today's challenges. So one of my favorite new quotes is about change blindness, and I'm just gonna paraphrase it. It's by a man named Sam Arbusman. And basically what he said is that we have a problem with change blindness, and it's not that we don't have access to information, new information. A lot of people have some components of new information on workplace culture and, and what kind of extraordinary uh, cultures are starting to trend. But the two problems that he said around change blindness are that most people don't wanna go out of their way to really look at doing something new. Like they may look over and say, oh, that company is doing some great things. That's fine for them, but we don't wanna go through all of that trouble. And so they don't necessarily understand the ramifications of holding on to the old culture models when it's very important for them to progress into the new culture models. The other thing that happens is people become worried that uh, if they question what they've been doing, that they're even going to lose their identity or their significance in the workplace. So it takes a very strong positive ego to be an effective leader that develops other leaders and that can move forward without clinging to old ways of doing things. The last thing that I want to say is that when you have an extraordinary workplace culture, what you've been able to successfully do through not only training but also regular mentoring with your team is transfer responsibility to people, to everyone, for what's called task ownership. So if I'm working in an organization where everybody's learning how to manage relationships, everybody's learning how to manage their productivity, to manage their engagement levels, to manage their purpose, values, visions, goals, procedures, and roles, and I'm just there to help make sure that they're paying attention to that and that they're taking actions into that, um, what you've done is you've created this supportive system so that the managers aren't overburdening uh, being like policemen and they're free up they're freed up to run the productivity and meet the objectives of the business because all of the employees are part of supporting and a culture of excellence, an extraordinary culture. So again, I, uh, I'm grateful to be here. My name is Judy Ryan. I'm the CEO of LifeWork Systems. If you'd like to reach me, you can reach me at judy at lifeworksystems.com or 314-239-4727. I also want to just leave you with this thought of please join me in my mission to create a world where people love their lives. Thank you. <laughs>